Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, Mr. Kyle Noble. Kyle Noble is a singer-songwriter based in Edders, PA. He played lead guitar in the country rock band Hometown Strangers for over for around three years. In 2021, he began focusing on songwriting and solo music. Kyle is currently working on his forthcoming album, EP, Onward. His music blends acoustic blues, folk, and rock with strong lyrics tied to life experiences. You can find Kyle on all of his projects on Spotify, Instagram, on Facebook. All of those links are in the description below. Kyle, how are you doing today? I am doing really well. Good, man. So what was it that got you started as a, as a musician? What got you into it? What Was it an album? Was it the random guitar or drum case that you had around? Or uh, Well, uh, I grew up in a really musical family. Uh, there was always a drum set in the house, so my dad left that, and my brother played all the time. So whenever he wasn't there, I would just always sneak in and try and you know hit around on the drum set. And it got to a point where I was messing with all his little mu- music gear and stuff. Where he was like, you know what? If you're gonna be m- touching my stuff, I'm just gonna, sh- to do it. <laughs> I'm gonna show you how to do it right. Yeah. So he gave me little tips, and I just kind of ran from there and progressed as the years went by. And you must have picked up a guitar somewhere. Yeah, he had, <laughs> so the drums was my first thing. I loved them. Loved, I love loud noises. And uh, from there, he had an electric guitar in his bedroom. And the same deal, I would sneak in when he wasn't at the house, and I would just kind of noodle around. And I had friends that were learning in school and everything. So I knew little things, you know, like Smoke on the Water mm-hmm. or uh, White Stripes, Seven Nation Army. And I would just go from there and slowly... Hanging out with my friends that were playing things, uh, I learned to pick things up from them, and I I just kind of ran with it. Once I picked the guitar up, I just, I loved playing it all the time, so I just kept doing that and trying to learn songs that I would hear, kind of the same way I did drumming, just hearing it out and trying to figure out what they were doing. So at what point did you think that, oh, I could do this for, like, money, or in front of other people? (laughs) Uh, Not until 2015. This was... Back when I started picking stuff up and sneaking into my brother's room, I was maybe 9 or 10. So 2015 was when I was kind of like, you know what? I might be able to actually go out and do this a little bit. So what was the first time that you actually went out and did something? Oh, um, I went. I, I was working at a golf course down the street from my house called Valley Green Golf Course. And they had music there every Friday, Saturday. And my kitchen manager at the time was in a band that was playing there. And I believe the first time he kind of gave me a shot, like, hey, you want to open up for me? Like, I know you play a little bit. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I opened up for him. And then shortly after that, my GM <laughs> finally, after begging him, he finally was uh, he's like, you know what? We'll give you a night. That's awesome. Did you, yeah. Were you nervous as anything? Oh, or? my gosh. Yeah, I was so nervous. I was shaking. My pitch was like terrible it was already bad because i was just starting but i was like so nervous the whole time it was i think i was going through songs like way faster than they actually were i was so nervous what songs did you do to that point did you do covers or originals or just covers Uh, it seems most places kind of just want you know uh covers covers they're like play stuff people know so that's how it started i just learned i learned enough for three hours and i think i slipped in a couple originals maybe Mm. But back then, I didn't have too many. I maybe had like five. So what got you into doing more solo stuff? Well, uh, when I played in the band, I'd always done solo stuff. And I started off in 2015 doing solo stuff. And I was writing, not to the degree I am now. But uh, I just that's how I just, I was like, you know, I like, I don't want, like, I played in so many bands. And it was hard to rely on other people sometimes. Mm -hmm. To the point where I was like, you know what, like, I want to do what I want to do. And... I don't want to have to worry about everybody's schedule matching up or, like, does this person want to play out? This person doesn't want to play out. So, I was, you know what? I'm just going to try this on my own. And my dad gave me one of his guitars and said, like, let's see what you do with this. And I just kind of started sending it pretty much. So what was your songwriting process like? You said it wasn't – you weren't writing to the caliber that you are now. Right. What was that evolution process like? Back then, I think I tried – really hard to just write things that sounded uh, like radio friendly in a sense. Mm. Uh, like I, I didn't know who I was in a sense of like songwriting. So I just tried to write like country stuff and I would 
not copy, but, you know, like the classic kind of country themes, you know, like, and obviously a lot of it was, you know, girls and yeah, love girls, and, tractors and trucks. And yeah. <laughs> trucks. Yep. Men stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what kicked you into writing one of original material? I always liked doing my own thing. And even though I learned all these covers and I like learned to play all these songs, I always had something to say myself, even if it was just, you know, something I felt like I couldn't say to somebody in my life. So I would write songs and kind of like that would be my way of communicating things that I was thinking or feeling. So I started that way and it just kind of like the more I did it, the more it kind of made sense when I would look back on what I was writing. So came from a place of... uh just wanting to say what I wanted to say, in a sense. Very nice. Yeah. So we have one of your songs, uh, Don't You Know. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that one. So this one I wrote while I was in rehab. Mm-hmm. I met somebody there. Uh, she had gone through a lot. And originally the song was going to be, uh, like, it was called Simone. That was her name. Mm. And uh, I just kind of wanted to, like, the idea was, like, you're not alone. You know, I, I understand she went through so much. And it was just kind of, I just, I guess uh, I wanted to let her know, like, she had more support than I guess she thought she had. So it came from there. And it was just kind of like the struggles that everybody goes through, like the dark places you can end up going through things like addiction, mental health. And so I wrote that. And it was, the idea was, like, I just kind of wanted to show her, like, hey, you're not alone. Like there is support here. Like we all love you. Like you are a great person. Don't ever doubt that. Like you can get through this kind of thing. Sweet. And if you want to find that, you can find that anywhere, but we're going to play it now. It's called Don't You Know by Kyle Noble. The world gets so cold Darkness is all you know It's so hard all alone Fill the void getting stone You can sell
Let's talk about more about you. You mentioned uh, you were in rehab. Let's talk about how, why you were in rehab to begin with Mm -hmm. and that whole journey for you. So from when I was maybe about 16 or 17, I was a partier. I really enjoyed drinking. And that was what ended up sending me to rehab was drinking. Um, Took a long time to get there. It was definitely a building up process. But over over the years, probably even at the beginning, I was a very uh, drink to feel or feel nothing thing. Mm. Uh, so it just snowballed over the years from, you know, 2007 or 8 until when I finally went in 2020. It took a long time. So what what is that process like? What was that process like for you? Did you ever go to AA? Did you did, did everybody in your mother say, you got to go to rehab? There was no, there was no like intervention for me. There was, it was a a slow realization over the years. I think I always knew that I wasn't drinking the way other people drink. And um, it was okay because there was, it seemed okay because that's just, if you look at anything with drinking, it's advertised so heavily. It says, please drink responsibly. But, you know, it's most people out there that, drink to the level that I was are still doing it and it's like that's pretty detrimental to your health you know and it's 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 just accepted socially so you know oh he was drunk or right, right. Oh, he's just having a good time oh he's just cutting loose on the weekends but you know and I'm not saying for everybody that's the issue that's the thing but I know for me it was uh it turned into you know from every weekend to every single night just to be able to go to sleep and then mm. um I would use uh, Xanax to kind of cut my withdrawal symptoms the next day. So I was drinking every single night, waking up using Xanax to get through the day, and then drinking the next night, every single night, probably from 2014 2014 until 2020 when I finally went to rehab. So when did you realize that it was enough? Mm. After... The whole time I was working in a kitchen, and that environment can be pretty crazy. Be very crazy. So that definitely was difficult. And when I finally left the kitchen, you know, I thought, oh, you know, I'll be able to kind of put this behind me and like drink normal, drink stop, yeah. normal quotation marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I didn't, I couldn't. Mm. So by that time, I had cemented this habit that I just could not cut back on. I tried so many times to, like, you know, give it a break. But even when I would not drink on a certain night, I still had, like, that addictive personality. Like, I would overeat like crazy. I would eat so much because I, I just had to, like, there was this void. I was just it had to be to something fill. I had to do. It had to be something. And, you know, what? It, but even when I wasn't drinking and I would, you know, take it out on, like, food, for instance, mm-hmm. um, I was just so depressed. So depressed. And, and it wasn't, I was never happy, like, the days were tough. I would get, you know, angry. I'd get like upset. The days were tough, but then as soon as I go to drink at that night, I'm in a great mood. Right. You know, yeah. everything's oh, this is you know, and, you, hit and your, I, you hit your high. Yeah, and you know, I was drinking alone. Like that's that says something right there. I you know, like I just to be happy, I had to like drink at the end of every single night. It's crazy. So where'd you go? How'd you reach out? How'd you? So it got to a point, and for a while, like probably from like. T- 2018 till 2020 I knew like I I would tell people like yeah I have a problem like I'm I'm gonna eventually probably need to get some help but I'm not gonna do it right now right I'll do it tomorrow yeah like you know I'll do it later and I didn't know anything about the process of like what to do and I had friends that you know had gone to rehabs or uh tried programs to try and help their addiction and it just always seemed so intimidating (laughs) <laughs> and like I said, I had no idea where to start. So I ended up finally going to my doctor. I got I, 
I, I had this awesome doctor from when I was a child. Um, his name's Clem Ciccarelli. He's amazing. And I had ended up separating from his practice, like kind of by accident. Mm-hmm. And I was seeing this other doctor, and I decided I wanted to go back. And when I came back, we did a whole checkup and everything. And he was like, I told him about my problems. And he was like, the only way I'll see you again, you know, was like, you got to cut out the Xanax. We got to fix your drinking problem because you are in terrible health. I was in like early onset liver failure. Oh, wow. And all these things. It was bad. And um, he recommended me Recovery Centers of America, RCA. And I still procrastinated. And it finally got to a point when he did call me back with like the blood results and everything saying like, you're in early onset liver failure. I was like, um, what do I do? <laughs> He's like, you should stop drinking and you should call the number that I gave you. And I called them and uh, they were amazing. They they offered to come pick me up that day. You know, wow. they were like, yo, we have beds. Uh, and I was I was very intimidated by it. I didn't know what it was going to be like. I, I, like I'm going to go to boarding school or? Yeah, in, in my mind, it was like like jail, jail or yeah. something. Like that's just... I think the stigma around it is like this person's going away for something bad. But yeah, they're going to rehab. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like you're going like, to an insane asylum. Yeah. That's that's kind of like always the perception I think when I was younger that I I viewed on it. I was like they can't control themselves. Like they got to go here. Rehab, yeah. But you know, like everybody needs a little help sometimes. Everybody needs a little help sometimes. Everybody's addicted in some sort of way. Coffee. 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 Social media. Caffeine. Social media. Sleep. Sleep. I love sleep, uh, but <laughs> food, <laughs> food. Yep. It and uh, so I finally went, and my mom took me up. It was outside of Philly, and um, yeah, I, I just went, and they were so welcoming. And every single perception of like the stigma that I had built up in my mind was just erased as soon as I started interacting with the staff there. They were amazing. They were super understanding. They knew exactly what I was going through. They had seen people off way worse than me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I went into, like, there's, like, uh, like a thing you go into before you actually go into the rehab where you're withdrawing. And mm-hmm. they pretty much supervise you through your withdrawal because you can die from withdrawal. Yeah, withdrawal is dangerous. Don't ever do it alone. It is very dangerous, and there's places that offer literally just a place for you to withdraw at under supervision, and that is the way to do it because, I mean, people have done it on their own, but it is a very dangerous thing, and you don't realize, like, you might think, like, oh, I'm not as bad as some other person, but, like... It's going to get you. You're still in it, and, yeah. you know, like, like heroin, alcohol, like, other things, like benzos, like, those are dangerous things to Even withdraw lust. from. Yeah. It's so dangerous. It is. It's, like, so, like... If you can go to a go to a facility that will go to a friend, even a friend, anybody, anybody, anybody that you can reach out to, anybody that you can trust. Yeah, just even if you don't feel comfortable going to a facility, go to a friend, go to yeah. a family member, see if they'll maybe just you know just watch over you, yeah. just make sure that you're fine. Because listen, if you pass out on your own, mm-hmm. ain't nobody gonna know. And that's the scary thing; you don't know until it happens. Until it happens, and then exactly. you're gone. Yep. And it's the same thing as doing the drug or alcohol yeah, same and thing. overdosing. Like, you don't know if there's fentanyl in it, and you don't know how much. Like, what if you do too much? Right, you never if know. If you're doing it alone, it's the risk factor just goes up so much higher. It's insane. So you had your withdrawal period. What? Uh, tell me how. What happened for you with your withdrawals? Honestly, for me, I was surprised that mine wasn't as bad as like I maybe guess I thought it would have been. Uh, it was still terrible. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. It was like probably two or three nights where I didn't sleep, or if I did sleep, it was covered in sweat, shaking, um, waking up constantly. Uh, nurses coming in to check on me, uh, uh, you know, treating me to try and not numb the symptoms, but to try and reduce the effect of the symptoms through going through that withdrawal. So. It was like three days of just constant sweating, shaking, super depressed. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Pretty much when you stop doing something that you've been addicted to like that, you're numbing your emotions that entire time. So that all slowly starts to come back, and it's overwhelming. It's very overwhelming. It's crazy how because you have suppressed your dopamine levels or uh, you've supplemented those, 
you're so used to it being up here, mm-hmm. you never really feel the low lows. That's right. And it just comes crashing over you, and you're like, oh, this is reality. You realize, like, the hole you dug. Yeah. You're like, oh, that was bad. <laughs> it felt good <laughs> while I was doing it, but wow, I can't even, like, function function without it. Like, this is crazy. I can't believe I let myself get here in yeah, a sense, you know? It's crazy the connections your brain will, won't let go of. Mm-hmm. For a very long time, like I said, three days, mm-hmm. three days of of trying to make that connection, and it's not able to. That's a short amount of time. That's a short amount. Of, for, yeah, that's for what you like. I was yeah. For others go girl. through it much longer. Yeah, some sometimes it's never ending. I've mm-hmm. heard it mentally. I'm sure mentally. Yeah, it's yeah. It's definitely that was the thing that was nice about Recovery Centers of America. They didn't just treat the withdrawal symptoms or the actual addiction side of it. They treated the mental health aspects, the root causes to what what was feeding your want for this addiction, you know? So for you, what was those root causes? Mm, childhood trauma. Um, uh, I was diagnosed there with like a manic bipolar, major depressive disorder. Um, so manic bipolar is mood swings. Like mm-hmm. it was hard to deal with my emotions growing up, not being medicated or anything. And so I felt things very strongly. And so for me, it was a numbing technique to not feel things so strongly, I guess. Um, that you had to fix or that you had created? It was always kind of in me. And it, it, like once I found alcohol when I was younger, I was like, it, for one, it made me very socially um, outgoing, which I was not very good at. I was very socially <laughs> awkward when I wasn't drinking. I felt awkward all the time. And it just made me, it felt like this thing that like, oh, it makes me my true self. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was, there's a few things, you know, like suppressing the mental health issues that I wasn't dealing with, trying to numb things, forget about things, like past things, terrible things that happened to me. And also just thinking that it was making me the person I wanted to be, that I wasn't able to be without it mm-hmm. in my mind. So So how long did you go for a rehab? I was in there for 30 days. 30 days. 30 days. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Some people spend there's way longer. There's people that were in there for their 10th time. More than that. And some people stay longer, some people don't stay as long. A lot of people will just come in for the withdrawal to get through that and then they think they're good. <laughs> and they didn't deal with any of the things that were causing that at that right. There's always something that makes you want to go out and drink. There's always something that makes you want need to have that uh, addiction that makes you have to have that drug or whatever. And you have to solve that problem first. You have to fill that hole first. Yeah. Then you won't need uh, whatever that and you need. And it's an ongoing process. It like, is an ongoing uh, it's, process. They say, like, the minute you stop working is the minute you start to go back. You backtrack. and It's true. It is. You know, much so. I work every day at it. Some days are really easy. Some days are really hard. Some days, you know, it feels like I don't have to work anymore, but I know, like, yeah, that's not an option for me. So do you know your triggers at all? Yeah, they're really weird. Uh, it's different for everybody, too. Yeah. Um, like, certain smells, certain environments, um, people, certain people. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah, like people I used to party with. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess you know, so, yeah. It's like, not that it's hard to see them, but like when I do see them, it takes me back to that place. Memories of like things we've done together. Yeah, that's always the thing, right? Whenever you can see somebody and feel so many different things all at once mm-hmm. because just of the experiences you've had with somebody. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Or like, this is a weird, a weird one, but if I smell like, say like I walk by like a trash can or a dumpster and there's that smell of like, old stale beer mm. or something like that I smell that and i'm like uh i need to get away from this mm-hmm. <laughs> like, or like um sometimes like cigar smoke or just mm. it's a bunch of different things uh like for at first one of them one of the big ones was like fire like a bonfire it's like oh yeah because like camping and all that jazz, yeah, or back just, in the day we yeah. had fires every single night every single weekend and drinking Drinking you there, yeah. Drinking and partying, you know. And oh, I can't imagine. It, that took me a while to get over because yeah. that's one of my favorite things, even sober, is like I love bonfires. Yeah, <laughs> anything fire, I feel like it's like primal. 
Yeah. You just have to love fire. Uh, oh, yeah. Fire. Uh, <laughs> big fire. Go boom. Yeah, the first fire I went to, and it was with my best friends who were like, you know, we won't drink around you. Uh, and I was there, and I was just so anxious, and I was, like, scared. And I was trying to explain. I'm like, I think I need to leave. And they're like, it's okay. Like, you I know, it's it's going to be okay. Like, what's wrong? And I was like, I need to leave. Like, I need to get out of here. Just the smell was, like, super overwhelming to me. And luckily, I've worked through that. Because, uh, like I said, it is one of my favorite things. I love right, bonfires. Yeah, Who not... doesn't like to be outside on a nice, like, fall or summer night? It's 72 fire. degrees and, like, a giant bonfire. And you're yeah. just watching the flames. True, truthfully, I do think it's. I think it's therapeutic, honestly. Yes, I. I do now. Yeah, I definitely do. I there's some nights where if it was a rough day. I'll just. My mom has a fire pit at her house. I live like five minutes away. I'll just drive over there, start a fire, and just sit by it and think. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. And anybody who has ever had anxiety problems, I highly recommend just go watch a fire. Mm-hmm. You don't. You don't have to listen. start it. Just listen. The crackles. Watch. Look up in the night sky. Mm-hmm. The bugs won't get you because you're having a fire. Yep. So you'll be completely fine. Yeah. Just sit around, watch, and look around. It's it's re- so relaxing. It's the practice of, I think, being in the moment and trying to clear your head of and focus on something that is just simple in front of you. And it's and funny, it's, something simple like a fire, the noises, the smell, what it looks like, the, the heat. environment you're in, the heat. Like looking up at the stars, like you said, like that sounds really nice. Just explaining or it does, describing it, it right so now, nice. doesn't it? it yeah, so nice. And put your phone away. That's another thing. Yeah. Uh, even if you're, if you, even if you're a quote unquote busy person who has to keep on their phone, set yourself at least like an hour. That's right. Yeah. Put it away. Don't I, look at it. My thing is, I'll put on a playlist and listen to some music, and I won't look at it until like you know, like five songs or. You know, if you really? stop, I'll listen to like some songs and I'll just kind of like vibe out. I can't even do that. If I know my phone is on and around somewhere, I'm going for it. But mm-hmm. if it's if I can't, yeah. it's like like even right now, I feel it in my pocket and yeah. I can feel the urge to because I'm also ADHD person, so I, okay. I, it's hard for me to stay on one task for yeah. very long without medication. I feel that. So if I have it in a different room and I know it's. Even if I know if it's in that room, my urge would be to get up and go get it. Yeah. So I'd like hide it from myself. It's crazy how, how it works. Like you put it away somewhere and you're like, oh, what if someone's trying to contact me? Yep. Like, I wonder if I have any notifications. Yep. Gosh, I should go check that. Okay, wait, no, be in the moment. Be in the moment. Be in the Great. moment. Relax. Watch the fire. Distract yourself. <laughs> yeah. It, well, that's, that's a large part of life is distracting yourself. From and you know, that takes a lot to get like good at. It does. It's not You're not going to be good at it the first time. Yeah, it takes we're a lot of practice. Ex- we're exposed to a lot of things like cell phones and social media that advertising twenty four seven are so good at grabbing our attention. And it's like learning to be able to slow down, take a breath, and just be human. Before you know, before cell phones, what did we do? <laughs> Sat around, and watched fires, things like that. Yeah, listen yeah. to music. Like, yeah, even going out with your friends, phoneless. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so nice. It's so nice. We're all just like, let's leave this. Let's go yeah. for a walk. Right, yeah. It's so much. It's so nice. Uh, whenever I go on a hike, turn, I don't bring my phone. Yeah. Unless, you know, I actually need, like, the trail stuff. But right. if it's, like, Chickie's Rock, where it's very simple, you just go up and come back down. Something you know already. Something you know already. Yeah. Leave the phone behind. You, you're in the moment. You're, <laughs> you're more aware of what's going on yeah. around you. I have friends that have literally switched to, like, those old flip phones. I had a friend for the longest time who had an old BlackBerry, and we all made fun of him for it. But he was like, "Well, I did that. and I'm like, I understand it now. <laughs> I completely there might be something understand to this. it. It might be something to that. Uh, he he kind of has it all together, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it was it was that moment. It's like, oh, he's organized at this time, and he actually gets his homework done, and he's a really good human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's really good at what he does. He's a really good human. He's good at this. And you know, like, what can I learn from him? Mm-hmm. So, uh, what next? You you've also dealt with cancer. Yes. So, uh, in 2014, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer, um, and so that process happened as went in for surgery, and then the problem was is like you know at that time obviously I was drinking, and I wasn't ready to deal with anything. 
So I, I pushed off the surgery for about two weeks because I'm like, they're like, we can do this tomorrow. We should do this tomorrow, like, or this week. And I'm like, oh, you know, I, I need to let my job know, which they were like, do what you need to do. Yeah, like, right. It's like, if, you, if it's cancer, your job is going to understand. I didn't think of it that way. You know, I right. just was like, I didn't want to face it. I don't want to do it. As soon as you hear that word, it changes everything. I'm it's sure. insane. Like, that word is just so powerful. Like, especially, like, you hear the word, if it's not, if, if you're not affected by it, like, whether it's one of your family members, friends, or, or something like that, if you're not affected by it, it's just a word in a sense where you're like, oh, that's a terrible thing. But then when you're in the doctor's office. And, and they say, you have cancer? And you're like. Yeah. You're like, oh, am I going to. Am I gonna die? <laughs> yeah, right. It's and, a, in some cases, you know, it's a yes, much so. or it's yeah. like eventually. And it's, uh, you know, I heard the word, and I was just not ready to face it. No one's ever ready, and everybody deals with it in a different way. But so I gave myself two weeks to kind of like get my affairs in order. You know, I went to my job, and for that two weeks, I drank a lot. Oh, I'm sure a lot. And I uh, finally ended up going in for the surgery. After that, they did scans and stuff. Because I waited, it spread to my lungs. So oh, no. I had to go through uh, three months intense chemotherapy, um, which was, uh, you know, an interesting experience sitting next to people in these chairs, just everybody getting pumped full of chemo. Some of them were using it just to stay alive. Some of them were in hopes of, I'm going to get over this. Some of them were just, you know, like I said, like just to stay alive, just buying time. You know, it was, it doesn't discriminate. There was mm. people that were, you know, very, like older people, but then there was kids, people my age at the same time, and and people younger than me. And at the time, I was twenty four. That's gonna be earth shattering to see. It was insane, and it's something that sticks with you forever. It was like I would bring my guitar in sometimes and try and play a little bit, so people weren't weren't all sad. You know, you people try to distract themselves the best you can, but you know, not everybody's able to do that. Some like and it's it's a different journey for everybody. Like for instance, you know, most people assume when you get chemotherapy that you're not you're gonna. Oh, obviously you lose your hair, you mm -hmm. lose weight, you can't eat. It's just, just in a sense to destroy the cancer. It's really can be damaging to your body you, as well. Yeah. Like the chemotherapy I went through was really intense on the lungs, and um, at the same time there was someone going through the exact same testicular cancer I had sitting next to me in a chair pretty much the same age as me. He was going out at like several times a week and was able to have beer and eat fried food. And it seemed like he didn't lose his hair. And it seemed to me like, how is this guy doing this? Like, and unfortunately from what I think I understand, like he didn't make it, mm. but like it was different for him. Like, and you know, it came back like not because of what he was doing. Just that I just the think the point is, it's different for everybody. Some people can still do some normal things, but for me, I know, like, you know, I was almost bedridden pretty much, and it was super intense. They tried to give me things to counter some of the symptoms of chemo, you know, like to line my stomach with this stuff called carafate, right, to, uh, so I could eat. It mm -hmm. turns out I was allergic to that. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> so it was even like, even while they're trying to, you know, make these symptoms not as, you know, affecting to me, it was... I was like, oh, well, this actually doesn't work. So it was still like a process of trial and error, trying to just get through the chemotherapy. And luckily for me, after the three months, I was cancer-free. So, you know, obviously, for the rest of my life, I will have to continue to do checkups and everything. Yep. But So that was the first bout with cancer. And I'm thinking, you know, like, oh, I'm good. Because I was really young for that cancer, apparently. That's what everybody tells me. I don't know. Um, in 2018, I, was, I found a lump in my throat. And... Um, I was, how do you find that? Was it? Oh, it just it just shows up one day. It's weird. Like really? they start. Uh, like from, you look at it, and it's like it, you can't. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it. Like in my. Could you, could you feel it without touching it, or could you just? I felt there was something there, and then like, when I touch it, it was like, oh, this is a lump. Like what is this? And from having right. found the previous lump, I was somewhat familiar with what they feel like. And I mean, it could always be something. And they always tell you that when you go in. Oh, you know, we're gonna send you for all these tests, but uh, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this. You know, it could be a cyst, it could be, it could um, be a million things. Yeah, you know? it could be anything. You know, it could just be your lymph node swollen. You know, whatever. Um, and so I found that lump, and I 
you know, went in and they did blood work and all this stuff and they come to find out, you know, I had thyroid cancer, uh, which they actually told me was probably, I, it's a very slow cancer and I probably had it before my testicular cancer and it just waits to show itself. That was kind of what was explained to me wow. by the doctor. So it finally reared its ugly head. And through that process, I went into surgery, which I'm, you know, at this point, I'm like, oh, well, I did this before. And they told me, they told me, you know, you have great chance. Like, you're not, this isn't going to kill you. Like, it, it'll be something you deal with for the rest of your life. But, like, it won't be take care of this. Like, you'll pretty much be able to live a normal life. So I'm like, okay, like, whatever. That last surgery, the, this is, the testicular cancer surgery was only, like, two hours maybe. So I was, like, thinking, like, yeah, this is whatever. They're going to take my thyroid. Like, this will be fine. It was, like, I think a six to seven hour surgery. And they cut, you know, a pretty large area of my neck and scraped my thyroid out, and Whoa. when I woke up, I was not expecting this at all. I had 38 staples in my neck. I had a drain coming out of my neck. I couldn't I couldn't talk. Like, I couldn't. <laughs> you're, I, you're I, just thought, like... I thought my playing days were over. Oh, no. I, don't, I didn't think I was ever going to be able to sing again, and it changed my voice from how it was previously. Did it? It did, yeah. Like, I didn't have any kind of, like, gravel in my voice before. Really? And, I like, my, uh, I think... The way I sang before, it was a lot cleaner in a sense, and I, and I, when I finally was able to start trying to sing again, there was a lot more gravel, and there was a lot. It was just different. I, I don't know. How That's got to gotta be weird to wake up one weird. day and then like oh, I don't recognize my own voice. It took me a few months to be able to sing again. It was it was really hard. I thought like, well, I'm gonna have to get a really good at guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to get way better at this because I'm not cutting it right now. And if I can't sing and just play chords, like, what am I going to do? Like, I obviously, like, no matter what, I always want to be involved in music. Of course. If I can't sing, if I can't play, like, I will figure out a way. Like, you see videos of people playing with their feet. They don't have arms. Yeah. I just saw the other day this person missing an arm uh, had a bionic arm and she was playing violin. I was like, that's amazing. What in the world? Like, how do you figure that out? That's that's dedication. And, you know, I had actually seen something like that previously. One of my good friends, um, Mm. he was in a band that was on tour. They got in a car accident. He lost his leg. He was a drummer. Oh, wow. And I watched him go through that process, which was you know, it was hard to see, but at the same time, it was very Impressive, inspirational. He, yeah. He powered through that. He's done, like, triathlons and stuff since then. Amazing, man. He, the willpower, he is so inspiring to me, and he is still a killer drummer. And they, they ended up making him, you know, like a special bass pedal. I think it had walls on the side, so mm. when he was drumming, uh, his foot wouldn't slide wouldn't off. Slide off. And you see it all the time, what, like, Def Leppard missing an arm. Uh, there's another, I think, I might be wrong, it might be a ghost inside, like another heavy metal band, or a hardcore metal band, that their drummer lost his leg to. I don't know. If <laughs> this, makes him that, this just makes it that much more metal. <laughs> it does. And it's, it's, but what's crazy is like, I think that that genre of music is such a powerful thing. And then yeah. when you hear a story behind the music that's like that, it makes it even more powerful. Like, the fact they can play like that. Uh, yeah. despite their inhibition, and they can do it po- most uh, sometimes better than they could before Yeah, because of that in- inhibition. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. I've seen people play guitar with their feet with no hands. I've yeah. seen... Uh, it's insane. I've, it's insane. It's so cool, though. It's, it's so like, cool. It is like I would have never begun to thought that was possible. Right. Right. This person doesn't have has misshapen hands. He's playing piano with his chin and his mm-hmm. his two arms. And I'm like, it's it's better than I can play. <laughs> He's playing something you know, better than I than I, I could feasibly do. Where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely, humans, and incredible will. Yes, if they find it. Yeah. And everyone has it in them. You just have to find it. And it, what, how do you want to direct it? You know. Mm-hmm. And. What are you passionate about? How can you move forward with this, you know, thing that's in a sense holding you back? But as you see, there's people out there that make it They'll happen. Figure it out. They figure it out. If you want it bad enough, you'll you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. It takes time. It takes time. Patience. It takes effort. It takes blood. It mm-hmm. Takes sweat. It takes tears. Absolutely. But you'll figure it out. <clears throat> Stick with something. Yeah. So after the uh, 
not to like just jump yeah, back. Jump back but, yeah. uh, after the surgery, uh, then I went through some radiation, and I did I did that. I had to be quarantined. Uh, my mom ended up going and staying with my brother for a little for about three days or four days, and I was quarantined in the house because it was like radioactive. Right, uh, I couldn't be around anybody. So I went through that, and then I was cleared of that, and kind of moved forward. That really, you know, going through all this uh, after after the testicular cancer, that was when I was like, you know, that was 2014, 2015 was like, after that cancer bout, I was like, you know what, like, I'm not waiting anymore. Like, that was a big thing, too, that pushed me to, like, do solo music. I was like, I only have one life. Yep. I've always wanted to do this, and I see people out there, you know, like, Dave Grohl, like, he's a huge inspiration to me. Like, everything he went through, like, losing, you know, his lead singer in Nirvana, and, you know, like, he's doing it all on his own. That first Foo Fighters album was, like, all him. And I was just always like, wow, like, I could try that. Like, because I can, I can play bass, I can play drums, and I can play guitar, and I can sing, like, fairly well. So after that cancer battle, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to send it. It was rough. Yeah. <laughs> it was a rough start. <laughs> but, you know, and then the second cancer bout just really, that was when I put, you know, my first album out after that. I was like, you know what? Like, this is going to be an ongoing thing. Like, this is going to be something. Like, I ne- I wanted to put something out there that was forever in a sense. Mm. And, you know, looking back on it, I'm really proud of it. At the same time, anything you look back on, you're kind of like, I can do better. Yeah, I can do better. <laughs> and like, was that actually me? Mm-hmm. And through all this cancer stuff and then going to rehab, you know, sobering up, I found myself again, which is great. And now the music I'm writing feels a lot more genuine, organic, and more like myself, which it was a long road to get there, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Speaking about uh, finding yourself in getting to your music we have another one of your songs take your time mm. tell me about this one this one i also wrote in rehab um it was when i was finally feeling everything again and like for so long it felt like i rushed i was just constantly go 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 like don't feel this don't feel that mm. what can i do to like distract myself from all these things and when i came up with it it was just kind of like I felt like I was starting to get in a place again where I could appreciate the little things in life and take my time in a sense like, okay, take a breath. Let's calm down for a second. Let's be in the moment. Let's, you know. Just relax. Not in a, I, I don't want to say it like not think about your problems, but like let's take that moment to just relax and just let go of some things and kind of. Look at the fire. (laughs) Yeah, just what we were talking about with the bonfire, kind of what that feeling should be in that moment. Uh, That was the idea behind Take Your Time was just to let it go. This is Take Your Time by Kyle Noble. out of the office walked down past the train tracks by the church and the bells made sound of the angels both beautiful and painful all at once I sat still as the sun met the west coast in the best clothes just for me I walked home to the sound of the city some say that she ain't pretty but she's mine
Take Your Time by Kyle Noble. This is all new music, you said. This is actually what will be on my uh, my EP onward. So tell me about uh, the creation process of that, who uh, your producer is, all that jazz. So I wrote majority of this in rehab. Um, that's I got out of rehab, and I had all this music. So uh, I had reached out to Rock Mill Industries. Uh, I, I have a few friends there, like Logan Summy. Justin Hershey, a few like those those two guys are. I reached out to Hershey because I know that you know he's also uh, sober, and right. I didn't know how to navigate <laughs> music anymore because I was playing bars everywhere. You know what I mean? Like everywhere you go and play, especially when you're playing in a country rock band, cover band, doing covers, you're playing bars, you're playing a lot of drinking, and I didn't really know how to navigate that. So I, I reached out to him to see you know like. Maybe we could like get together and talk, and like I could show him some music, and he was just like, "Let's record it." I was like, "Okay, okay, <laughs> all right." So we started in January 2021, and um, we went we went through a good bit. Uh, we ended up he like remodeled his entire sound shop. Uh, it was in this old they 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 have this old warehouse that was I think it's Rake Straw's Ice Cream in Mechanicsburg, mm. and they bought the warehouse and like gutted everything, made it into this awesome place. But uh, Hershey decided to renovate his ice cream cooler that was his office. So we took a break from doing the album and tore everything down, (laughs) ripped everything out. It looks so good now, though. It looks so good. It is so cool. But we went through that, uh, and we were slowly just kind of working on these songs. We recorded it in this ice cream freezer. And uh, it took... Till till just recently, two they're... sticks in there, not bad. Oh, yeah, it was it's very sick. good. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we we slowly worked through it all, and you know he was insanely helpful to me, and just 
such a great support. He's an amazing person. All the guys over at Rock Mill are just really great dudes. Like, if anybody is ever looking for anything music-wise, those guys are the way to go. They're just great people, and they care about the local community, even outside of the musician community. Hershey helped me tremendously, like, in this, like, helping with ideas for this, like, just different things to try. Like, because, you know, when you, like, go in the studio and you bring these songs, like, they weren't just like this. When I right, of them, course. You know I mean? yep. All the things that we think to add to them. Um, it was a really great process. I'm really glad that I got to work with him, especially. He's also one of your sponsors. Yeah. Or is your sponsor. Yeah. So tell tell people about that for people who don't know what a sponsor is. Uh, just kind of somebody that helps you through the process of becoming sober. Um. I really hope he doesn't mind that I shared that information. Oh. And I do apologize if it wasn't okay, but I think I think he'd be okay with it. I just uh he's been a tremendous help to me in my sobriety and also my music. He's an amazing person. I would do anything for that dude. He uh he's really kind of shown me the ropes especially in the sense of like getting back out there and playing because I left hometown strangers because I needed to like kind of focus on my sobriety and I, you know, part of it was I wanted to be you know solo singer songwriter kind of deal but at the same time like I said the places you play when you're in a band like that um a lot of drinking a lot of partying mm -hmm. it was hard like I remember one of the I think it was like if not the first gig I came back with them we played Sherman's Creek Inn and some random person came up and like had shots for the entire band and I tr I kept saying like no thank you no thank you and he just kind of stood his ground was like almost like offended that I wouldn't take this shot right. to the point where I was like okay fine and I took the shot and I put it on my amp and when I grabbed that shot my hand was shaking I was like okay and I put it on my amp and like everyone in the band was just looking at me like oh my gosh like we're sorry like are you okay like and I was fresh out of rehab. Yeah. I was excited to be back with my band members. I love them to death. They're like family to me. We would do anything for each other. But it was really hard to put myself in those environments. And, like, you know, I didn't want to hold them back to mm -hmm. things and just be like, well, I don't want to play this because I don't feel comfortable, which is totally okay. But, but I, it's it's a hard conversation to have. And I recognized, you know, that that wasn't something that was going to stop like with the band and who am I like I'm not going to get in their way of that like they're doing mm -hmm. great I'd love to see them doing great and I I don't want to like inhibit them from playing things that they're going to want to play just because you know I didn't want to be in that environment at the time especially being fresh out of rehab so I took a step back from the band I think that was in June and um like I said I love them to death but it was a great decision for myself and my sobriety it's the same, and to any of those other musicians that feel that like you're in that kind of situation, mm -hmm. it's okay to leave. It is. It's hard. It's hard. I still, I still feel the the weight of that decision. You know, I miss them mm -hmm. terribly. I miss playing with them on stage. It was, you know, such a cohesive unit. Uh, we were just we're family, and they were beyond supportive of my decision. Obviously, they were sad to see me go, but we still see each other all the time in so between yeah. their hectic schedule. Just because just because you have to leave a project doesn't mean you have to leave the people. That's right. And, you know, yeah. they say to me all the time now, like, we are so proud of you. We're so happy for where you are, and we love to see the position you're in. We miss you as a band member, but we wouldn't trade it either for the world to see where you're at now. And that hearing that from them especially is like, it kind of makes me feel like, you know, you did make the right decision. I was so scared that I was going to lose these people from my life because mm -hmm. it seems that's the way it goes once you leave a project like that. Like, oh, you know, yeah, we'll keep in touch. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but with them, it was really, it was more than just a band. It was family, like I said. They're some amazing people. And you mentioned uh, having people come up to you at, at a bar and be like, yeah, I'm going to buy your shot. yeah. You got to realize that you can't say no, even because if the person has a problem with that, that's their problem. You know, I shouldn't have to explain myself. No, if I don't you want shouldn't. Something. You shouldn't have to. You know, like, or like, uh, why can't you bring me some mozzarella sticks? 
Why can't you make me some food? I won't take some drinks, but I'll take all the food you'll ever give me. Give me some chicken fingers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want a shot. I want some mozzarella sticks. <laughs> well, it's it's so true because uh, I don't I don't drink either uh, for multiple reasons. Um, for the most part, I don't drink. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll clarify that statement because sometimes I do drink. Um, but most of the times, like, anybody anybody who knows me is like, you want you want me to buy you a drink? No. You want me to you want you want to smoke? No. Mm-hmm. It, it, whatever it is, no, yeah. I'm good. Uh, give me some food if you really want to. Give me some food. Give me some food. I'm oh. always hungry. I'll, I'll take that. You know, like I don't know. I feel like giving somebody food is one of the like. Best it's things more. You can do. It's more than. A Why drink. do you think grandmothers always want to feed you? You know. <laughs> and and the food is infinitely better than a drink, in my opinion. I saying. love food. Yeah. Give <laughs> give me some chicken. Give me a. If you're gonna give, give me a drink, give me some juice. Give me some juice. I want yeah. some juice. I'll take a sprite, please. Guava juice. Guava juice. Yeah. So it was uh definitely interesting going through all that. You know, like the uh learning to be out playing again. Mm-hmm. Very hard. It took me a long time. I stopped playing for a while and I but the nice thing about it is I can pick and choose where I'm gonna be. And the other nice thing about it is say I do play somewhere that like I'm somewhat uncomfortable with. Now now it's a little easier that I have some time in. I'm in and out, and I feel bad somewhat, like for the people that book me at that venue. But for the most part, the places that I play now, like most of the people know me and know right. my situation, and they understand like I'm not gonna hang around at a bar after my gig, not anymore. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll stop, like if I see a friend, I'll, I'll like talk to them. You know, I smoke cigarettes, so I'll be like, let's step outside, I'll smoke a cigarette with you. But um, it's just nice to have control in a sense, over myself. Like, there's not this big breakdown of gear anymore. Right, where, it's just you, know, you and your guitar yep. and whatever else you bring. Like an amp, my guitar, and... And I, your microphone. I break that stuff down in, like, like 20 a, minutes tops. Right, yeah. It's, Whereas before, it's like a drum set, a, drum, a PA system, uh, loading up the entire vehicle, you know? Yeah. It, 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 it's so much more time, just people standing around, and... Yeah. And it's it that The most dangerous times for somebody who's, like, in your situation is before the gig and right after the gig. Those are the worst times because yeah. it's it's when people want to come up to you and stand around and say, "Oh, you should stay and oh, yeah, come talk to us, come, come be around us." Right? Yeah, we're wasted and yeah, like you know, we're having that's, fun. You should have that's fun fine too. and fun. I enjoyed that before. Yeah, but now I don't mind being around people drinking, right? But that's it's true. hard for me. Like you were talking about triggers earlier. If I'm around somebody who is completely gone, yeah, yep. I can't be around that. I cannot, I, I can't deal with it. I hate those people. You know, everybody has something they're trying to, I guess, feel better yeah. about. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me super drunk, like, after knowing my story, and been like, you know, I have a problem, but I'm just not going to do anything about it. Like, I respect you so much and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm here if you need, yeah, I'm say, I'm here if you you need can, something. Yeah. Like, I can, if you want it. Because I'm not about forcing anything on anybody. Of course. But... If you, you decide, because you know what, like, the saying is true, like, you have to help yourself. And that's what took me so long to put myself in rehab. I knew for so long. You, know, I, oh, you can't wait for life to happen to you. You have to take control of your own life. Mm-hmm. It's something that we've been said on this podcast a billion times, especially if you're a musician. You're never going to get out there if you never put yourself out there. Right. You got to just take that chance. and Take that leap of faith. That's the thing is the unknown is scary. It's I think it's one of the scariest things in life for humans yeah. is the unknown in any type of situation. But it's always what drives us. That's true. So I agree. You can't be afraid of the unknown because the unknown will, will happen to you, re- will happen regardless. The known will yeah. make itself known. That's tr- <laughs> You know, it's the thing in life, like, you never know what's right around the corner. And you're going along, you're like, yeah, everything's sweet. This is great. Boom, something happens. Yeah. Now, it's scary, but it's not like a lingering scary where you're like, okay, you know you have this problem. And you're like, oh, what's going to happen with this problem? Maybe I'll just see where it takes me. But the thing is... But you should take control of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's like, like I, you only make the opportunities that you take, right? Mm-hmm. You only have those opportunities that you take. You, you know, Many opportunities are going to present yourself because a bad thing can happen to you, but you can make good out of a bad thing. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. It's just you have to take control of it and turn it into a good thing. Mm-hmm. If you're going to let a bad thing happen to you, the only thing that's going to happen is bad. You know, that's that was a, a big thing for me was I was always like, 
really down on myself, like, oh, I can't do this, or like, you know, I, I, everything's stacked against me. You gotta kind of change your mindset and be like, what can I do with this? Well, yeah, exactly. What I, these are the cards that were dealt me. Maybe it's not a good hand, right? But I can ma- I can make good on this bad hand. And I am by no means saying it's easy. Oh, it's not easy it's at all. One of the hardest things to do in your life is to like take control of, of your, your own life. life. It's, it's so, so hard. hard. It really is. It's, it's insane. Because society is probably against you. You know, there's so many things that say that you can't make it. That blah, 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 blah. Look at people with their own businesses. Exactly. That kind of drive. Yeah. That's not easy to that's, find. And you know, they wake up. So some days and and they're and they're in the red, yeah, you know, and it's it's all about just taking that chance and seeing where it goes, you know. And it's okay if you fail. It's totally okay it's to fail. It's totally okay if you're gonna yeah. fail a hundred times before you get your one success. I completely agree, <laughs> and well, I can tell you, I've failed a thousand <laughs> times a before I got anywhere that I feel like okay, you're in a good spot now, you know. And it just takes time. It takes longevity. Mm-hmm. To uh, and and we were mentioning Cody Kilburn, uh, one of our great friends. Uh, success looks different to everybody. You got to find what yes. looks like success to you. Yeah, he posted like a Facebook post. And this is a long time ago, I think. Like it was not recent, but it said something like, "Just because you know you're not playing massive stadiums or something like that doesn't mean you're not a successful musician." And there's so many different ways to be like a successful person in the music scene and. Yeah, you can be an audio engineer. You can be yeah. you can be the uh, stagehand. You can be the mixer. You don't have to be up even there. Even if you're just a session player. Yeah, even it, yeah, literally, you even know? if you're just hopping around to different sessions and if, that's all you do. If you're working towards something and if you're just putting the time in, you're successful to me, I think. Yeah, I was gonna say even even regardless of what you're doing, if you're making people feel something, yeah. That's success. That's and you know, like nail on the head. That is my biggest thing with this music, especially that's going to come out. My, I felt so alone when I was going through everything. And I wasn't, but I felt alone. Yeah, it feels like you're alone. I don't want people to feel that, what I felt. So, like, with my music, I just want them to maybe hear it and just realize, like, they're not alone. They're not going through this alone. And there is hope on the other side if they choose to seek it. Yeah, it's, it's been, I've, I've heard it this way. Right, it, it's a it's a firewall. Right, mm-hmm. you're standing between yeah. the firewall, um, and you're scared of scared of it because it's fire. It's gonna burn. Mm-hmm. But if you push through that on the other side, it's heaven. Yeah, and you for know, lack the, of a better term, things that we can overcome. And yeah, it's, it's gonna incredible. hurt. It's gonna hurt. Yeah, but if you push through that fire on the other side, there's gonna be a beach. It's like a rebirth. Yeah, it's 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 refining yourself. Yeah. Yeah. What is the saying about, you know. Diamond under pressure, or <laughs> coal what, under pressure, coal under pressure uh, yeah. makes diamonds. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. You know, we're all just working to try and. I think we're all just working to try and be a little better each day. At least that should be the goal. That should be the goal. Yeah, and the only way to do that is to push yourself. Push yourself. Be uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable. If you're comfortable, you're not going nowhere. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So we have one of your. Uh, Final songs, War Stories. Tell me about this one. War Stories, geez. Um, War Stories is kind of a a lot of the things I went through while I was in my active addiction. Um, most of these things in the song actually happened to me. Mm. Um, not the last verse. That's a little crazy. That was just kind of storytelling, like up to the end. Like some of it happened to me. And, you know, yes, nothing. at some point you have to be like, okay, yeah. how do I make this into a good, right. a good song? Good yeah, story. so it was kind of me just getting out like all these things that happened to me or that I went through and being like, oh my gosh, wow. I can't believe I put myself in that situation. And most of them was me putting myself in those situations. And um, at the time I was listening to a lot of like Jason Isbell drive-by truckers kind of thing and like their way of describing things really hit me and this was kind of like took my hat to like that style and uh i just kind of wanted to put it all out in a sense of some of the things i've been through because this is not just like a storytelling song in a sense of like something that's in my head this these are things that like happen and i just kind of wanted to like get that out as i turned this new page of like sobriety i wanted to yeah i'm just reiterating the same thing 
<laughs> no, I just wanted good. to put out all these things that happened to me and make a fun song out of it, I guess. No, yeah, no problem. Uh, this is War Stories by Cal Noble.
And that was War Stories by Kyle Noble. If you want to find all of his stuff, be sure, where can they find you? You can find me on Spotify, Amazon Music, at least my old album. This All this music is going to be on the new one, which uh, it's not set in stone, but I'd like to put it out in November. That is the two-year mark for my sobriety. Mm. So I'd like for it to come full circle since this was all written in rehab. But you can find me, you know, YouTube, uh, Spotify, Amazon, iTunes. Do you have any gigs coming up? I do. Um, let me pull out the old calendar here. I know next Thursday. So next Thursday, the 8th, I'm playing Harrisburg Beach Club from 6 p.m. to 9. And then nice Friday place. the 9th, I'm playing. Oh, the Beach Club is so nice. It, so cool. You know, I, <laughs> I have a small bone to pick with them. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah here's, a, here's a funny little story. Um, they had us up on the balcony with, with the lights, and you, the beach club is right by the river. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, well, you know this. Yeah. Uh, but it, so it's a really great place. Really good food. I the food high truck marks, there. High marks for it. Yeah. They put us right beneath the lights on the balcony, and when the nighttime came around, um, every bug in the five mile radius. Oh. Uh, <laughs> right by the river. Right by the. You river. You are by right. the river. Don't forget that. Yep, and so we had we had to stop a little bit early because we I I was playing my piano and every time I would squish a bug as I was playing. The, oh playing the my piano. gosh, are you serious? Yep, and <laughs> Cody was getting all of all of the bugs in his throat. That is like the worst thing when you're playing, especially outside. Obviously, like where you're like like I've had like bees come up near me and stuff, and yeah. they're like bugs, and I'm like, no, get away! But at the same time, you're playing, you can't stop. You can't stop. Like, there's been right, times yeah. I'm like. Mm, mm. <laughs> okay, like trying to lean away from it and I'm getting away from the mic so I'm like screaming louder uh, yeah bugs outside particularly in summertime yeah, yeah by the river by the river underneath the lights yep I'm gonna really hope that Thursday I don't deal with that but Thursday otherwise great venue I, I love the I, venue I love the idea of it I uh, think that it's great and I think it's so good is it I think it's Leanne she's the manager there she mm. seems very on top of it because I get those I get those gigs through uh DEG okay. live acts like Sean Caraby, DJ DJ Sean Caraby or DJ Caraby nice. up in Harrisburg. So that's really cool that he's also able to like he goes out of his way for like you know singer songwriter musicians and gets that's them like awesome. really yeah. cool gigs and really cool places. Like he used to get us like Arugas and Permani Brothers. Unfortunately, they didn't really Permani Bros. You mean yeah? Like I the played one the Permani Brothers, not the one in Lancaster. I think I played the Arugas down here a while back. I did play the Permani Brothers. Down like Leader Heights. Oh yeah, that one and the one over by Cap City Mall. I think I played that one. I wish I knew more <laughs> more places. I didn't know for many bros. bros it's hard. Cause... It's hard to play a place like that. It is because I, I like can imagine. I think they just want more. Like it's a sports bar. Yeah, right. People aren't really like. I, People Obviously, aren't there for the music. They're yeah. more there for the sports. There's been times I've played places like that, and I play like a song like Friends in Low Places. You'd think like you'd have right. the whole place singing because everybody knows that song. Everybody loves that song. Everyone's and like, it's Next. just like, yep. Yep. And I'm like, I just played you a banger. <laughs> what are you doing? They're like, I want to hear the NFL Fox. News. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so hard playing somewhere when there's football on. It's like, why am I here? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just background music to the football game. What am I doing? There's and then Friday the ninth next week, I'm opening for Hometown Strangers at I think it's Riverside Camping Association out here in Lancaster, Riverside, something. And I then, wish I knew. And then the tenth, I'm opening for Hometown Strangers at River Point Marina in Goldsboro, and then the fifteenth, I'm playing Linganore Winery in Maryland. Oh wow! Yeah, that'll be fun. I'm excited for that. I love playing wineries because it's not like people aren't there to get. Super drunk. Yeah, people are there just enjoy. Kind of like, and I feel like it's it's kind of an environment where like you can play more intimate things and kind of more originals. So I'm really excited about that one too. And I'm sure you can find all of this on your Instagram and Facebook as well. Yeah, um, Facebook, Instagram. I do have like a band camp, but it's really old. <laughs> Got some really old stuff on there, like early stuff. But yeah, Facebook, uh, Instagram, K Noble Music, twenty five, um, and then. All the streaming services as well. If you want to follow us, you can find us anywhere. Just search up the story Koi Rosen, C O R Y R O S E N. We're 
kind of done with our radio time, but we're going to continue on on Facebook Live just to get some final questions that I like to ask everybody on the show. So if you want to continue, follow us there. Uh, with all that said, we're going to get you guys back to the radio. Where is my mouse? There it is. <laughs> okay, cool. Cool. So last few questions Yeah, we have. What is the best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? Hmm. I don't know if I've gotten that much advice. I've really? kind of just been winging it this whole time. No. Um, just keep at it. Stay persistent. Always practice. Always practice. Yeah, that, Always that practice. last one. Always practice. Don't stop in the middle of a song if you mess up. That's another one. Never. Oh, my gosh. Never stop. Never stop. You. If you, first off, if you make a mistake, you're probably the only one in the room besides any other musician that realized that. Yep. But if you stop and you... Uh oh, you bring attention to it. Uh, that's when everything goes wrong. Yeah, you know, so many times I've been like, "Oh, I messed up here." And my friends are like, oh, "I didn't know. I didn't see." I'm like, I played a wrong chord, or like I stuttered on a word. And they're like, "Dude, people I, I, are not." You got to realize that at some point, people, especially if you're doing like bars and stuff like that, yeah, oh. <laughs> people aren't there to pay attention to you for the most yeah. part. It's I, background anyway, music. It's background music. Don't. Kill your uh, like worry yourself about yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> it's so true. It's it's so true. Oh and, my gosh! And the right answer for anybody that comes up to you and says you did a great job is thank you. That's it. Don't say thank you. don't. I really appreciate that. Yeah, say thank you. No matter no matter if it was the worst show you've ever done. Yeah. Say thank you. Thank you. Because you're gonna ruin the magic for them. And it'll be like, oh, you know, I did this, and um, because then they'll be like, I didn't even want to talk to you that long. Why are we sitting here? <laughs> I didn't need to know all that. You just yeah, say like, thank you. Just say thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's their perception of it. Yeah. Even if it's not your own. What is one thing that you know now about your craft that you wish you had known uh, when you first started? I'd say uh, to be yourself. That's the biggest thing I've found. It I is. felt like I was trying so hard to make something people would want to hear. And when I finally wrote things for myself, I felt like that's when people started to more notice, like, people can oh, tell. I like this. And it's like, we all go through things, you know? And I might be going through something in the way that I express it through my music. Someone going through something completely different could relate to what I'm saying in my songs. So, like, just be yourself. Don't try so hard. That, that would be, if I could look back on my, if I could talk to my pre, like myself in the past, I'd tell myself that. Like, don't try so hard. Just be yourself. And write for yourself. Yeah, because people can tell when you're not. Yeah, people and I, can, that's how I feel about some of my old stuff. I'm like, man, I was really forcing that. Yeah, right. It's like you got to be yourself because that you can you can do yourself the best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no one else is you. No one else is you. We're all unique in our own ways. Elvis has already been Elvis. Yeah. Prince has already been Prince. Yeah. And you know, it's cool to like hear something that's like, oh, it reminds me of that. But like, right, yeah, you got to have that individuality. Yeah. If you want to, this is what I love about a lot of people. They take covers, they make it their own. I love that. Yeah. I try to do that too. Have you ever heard Cody Kilburn's arrangement of Billie Jean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <it's, laughs> I just love listening to him play. He is so good. Like, I love, I love his voice and I love He's just the way he voice. does it. He's got a killer voice. Killer We've, voice. We were playing for a minute together back in the day. We, uh, Matt Ruth, who runs a lot of open mics in York, or at least used to. I think he's starting to get back into it. Me and my friend Tom Mehal, uh played with Matt. And he's like, oh, I know this guy, Cody. Like, Let's get him in here on guitar to help me out with guitar. And that's how I met Cody. Didn't end up going anywhere with it. But like, you know, we played a couple gigs together. I got him like a gig up at the golf course, him and Matt and stuff. And we played some gigs together. And then we're both in like DEG sometimes, but uh, that's another thing. Make friends in the music community. Make friends. Make friends. Definitely, like, it's not that hard to do. Like, it's so it's so important, but it's also just nice to like yeah. be able to like reach out to somebody else in the local music scene and be like, "Hey, what do you think of this?" Or like, "Hey, would you be interested in like doing this?" Or just to know what they're <laughs> capable of and like everyone, every, especially especially around here, I should say. Everyone is open to new music. I, I've found that too. I, yeah. I believe everyone that's in this local scene, and I feel like the scene goes, you know, from Lancaster to Harrisburg, New York. To Harrisburg, New York to, to Reading, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a whole central PA. Everybody wants to do stuff. 
together. Mostly, too. yeah. Yeah. Anyone you reach out to, I mean, sure, it might take a little time to get it worked out. Yeah, you got to schedule and all that. Like, for the most part, like. Everyone's down. Everyone's down. Especially in an open mic. You can just be like, yeah. hey, you want some keys? You Go up, walk up, do some keys. If you yeah. bring in a if you bring an accordion or like you know like an accessory instrument, I don't know why I named accordion, but <laughs> <laughs> but like like a saxophone or a clarinet or whatever. Yeah, go up. You can go up there. Hey, can and I play. play this with you? Yeah, right. Sure. You know, I'm gonna play this chord progression. Can you do something with it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just played. Uh, I was up in Lake Ontario uh, recently for vacation, and my best friend's cousin happens to be. I think he went to Berkeley. Mm. He is an amazing singer. An amazing banjo player, amazing guitar player. I sat there, we traded a couple songs back and forth, and we were just noodling a little bit on each other's stuff. And it was like, wow, that's what this music is. Just is. Fun. That's what it should be. Hearing his little banjo licks in the background, I was like, this is so sick. Yeah, it's so incredible what, what you can do like with just like original music. Yeah. There's um, so many great musicians around here that, that will literally, they can come in anywhere because they already, yeah. they, there's that good. <laughs> I went to an open mic and I met, uh, his name is FaZe. That's his rap name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he was like, hey, you want to play guitar? And I'll just, like, rap over it. I was like, absolutely. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I love that stuff. Like, we, like, did some cool stuff together. I was. Like, just for the open mic. But it was, like, yeah. so much fun. And it was, was literally me just the other night at TELUS outside the, you know, broken, busted up piano that, that's, you know, that's out yeah. there. Uh, I just play, play around stuff. And all these, uh, I forget. Mighty M, uh, there's a few others that I can't rem- really remember on the top of my head, but uh, they were just out there, and I started playing, and they're like, keep going, keep going, and, and we're just messing around yeah. and, and having a good time. You know what's funny is sometimes I think like uh, I run out of, st- like if I run into a situation where I'm like, I kind of ran out of stuff to play, I have this thought in my head that like nobody really wants to hear just jamming, but it's like there's been times Ooh. where I've had my loop pedal where I like set stuff up, I beatbox into it, and it's got like a beat and like a rhythm to it, and then I'll just kind of like solo a there. little bit, yeah. And like people are just chilling, yeah. they like it, and I'm like in my head, I'm like I have this sense of urgency, like oh, I gotta get to a song they know. Like people do just like to hear Did jamming, like vibing out. Yeah, that's a, just get people to vibe out. That's the whole goal. So, what is one of the best or worst or funniest things that ever happened to you on a gig? On a gig. Best or worst or funniest things? Well, there's that, that shot situation. Shot situation that, would, yeah. that would probably be under worst. Funniest. Hmm. You ever I, drop I your guitar and break it in pieces? Or? I've never done that. I've uh, Back when I was drumming, I remember I like threw a stick into the crowd by accident. <laughs> like, and it hit somebody. And I was like, oh. And then I'm sitting there playing drums with one stick. At the time, I didn't have like a gig bag on the side of my floor, Tom. So I was just like, I was like, oh my God. And the person ended up bringing the stick back up to me, but it, like 30 seconds had already gone by. The song was almost over. I was like, oh my God, it's so embarrassing. I can't believe I just threw this drumstick at somebody. (laughs) That's that's so hilarious. It was a hard throw, too, because I was like hitting a cymbal and I went, bam, and it just slipped right out of my hand. And I was like, that's the nightmare for a drummer. I was like, oh my God. I just, I just impaled a person with my stick. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, I'm sure there's some other stuff that, you know, I've I've probably done during gigs that I was like, oh, my God, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> that's stuff probably too many to remember. Yeah. yeah, I just try and black it out, you know. <laughs> try and let's just move forward with that. We're yeah, not, not ever bring it up again. We're going to ignore that one and continue on with this song. Mm. <laughs> well, hey, this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed myself. I appreciate you having me out here. Yeah, man. Kyle Noble. Be sure to follow him everywhere. Uh, that's Facebook, Instagram, Kyle Noble Music 25. K Noble Music 25. K Noble Music 25. You can find and him on Instagram. Noble is spelled N O B L E. N N O B L E. Like a noble. Like a noble person. Like a noble person. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say Nobel Prize. Not Nobel. But that's not right. That's, that's not A lot quite of people, right. and there is no K in front of it. <laughs> I get that a lot. Really? Like a silent K. I guess Nobles, the amusement park, maybe. Knobles. Yeah. Knobles. A lot of people have called me that. Hey, Knobles. <laughs> hey. Yeah. You can find them on Spotify under Kyle Noble. Yeah. Yep. If, yep. Uh, and then Hometown. Hometown as well. Hometown was my, uh, well, if you look up Hometown, it was my album that I put out in 2019. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, if you want to follow us, 
and support us, be sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends. If you really want to support us, we have merchandise out. We have stickers and we have shirts and hoodies with the first 50 guests on the back. Those will be coming out in October. So if you want one, be sure to order them now. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of today. We have on a guest, we have two guests this Sunday. <clears throat> we have Noah Gibney, uh, a, a local guy from Reading, PA, uh, 15 years old. And he's wow. doing music uh, nowadays. He's uh, apparently he's he's met President Biden with his what? album. Yeah, with his album. Yeah, from, from his album. Yeah. Wow. So that's pretty cool. That is really cool. So I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, we have Genius, also a guy from over in York or Harrisburg, rather. Uh, he's a rapper from over there. I'm excited to talk to him about all that stuff. And then this whole uh, next week, we got a, almost one every single day. So be sure to tune in for that's that. Awesome. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you guys later. Bye.